Hello guys, I hope you're all doing well. In this video, we are going to be seeing the amendments applicable for uh, CA inter corporate and other laws. All right, uh, the amendments which are applicable to CA inter relating to income tax are already uploaded on my YouTube channel. You can watch them, uh, they're already there. But this session is going to be all about the amendments relating to law. All right, we'll go through them one by one, simple amendments only. The very first amendment relating to small company and important amendment, let me explain the concept to you over here. See, what is a small company? A small company is a company whose paid up share capital does not exceed 50 lakh rupees and its turnover does not exceed 2 crore rupees. But this 50 lakh rupees, the act is giving the power to the central government. The central government is, if required, you can increase the 50 lakh rupees up to 10 crores. Okay, and if required, you can increase the turnover number up to 100 crores. Now, exercising this power, the central government had, you know, prescribed the paid up share capital number to be 2 crores and the turnover number to be 20 crores. Right, this is the existing provision. Now, they have further revised these numbers. The paid up share capital has been further increased to 4 crores and the turnover has been further increased to 40 crores. Basically, the company's access, small company is a company whose paid up share capital should not exceed 50 lakhs and turnover should not exceed 2 crores. But they have given power to the central government that the paid up share capital, this 50 lakh number, they can increase it up to 10 crore and this turnover number, they can increase it up to 100 crores. Exercising this power, the government had increased the paid up share capital number to 2 crores earlier and the turnover number to 20 crores earlier. This has been further revised now. Now the paid up share capital limit is 4 crores and turnover limit is 40 crores. So to summarize, as on date, the updated provision is like this. If my company's paid up share capital does not exceed 4 crores and the turnover is not exceeding 40 crores, if both these conditions are fulfilled, then the company becomes a small company. We can conclude like that. Okay, so what are the updated numbers? Paid up share capital should not exceed 4 crores and turnover should not exceed 40 crores. Okay, we have the word and. So both the conditions have to be fulfilled. All right, but listen, there are some companies which are not considered as small companies. No amendment here, but now that we are discussing about small company, let us finish fully. Okay, so there are some companies which are not considered as small companies. What are they? Number one, a public company. Even if the public company's paid up share capital is within 4 crore, even if the public company's tur turnover is within 40 crores, still, still it will not be considered as a small company. Then if you are a holding company of some other company or if you're a subsidiary of some other company, we will not consider you a small company. Then number three, section eight companies, even if they fulfill this criteria, they will not be considered as small companies. And lastly, we have statutory companies, companies which are set up by a special statute of the government. For example, we have NHAI Limited set up under the NHAI Act of the government. So on statutory corporations also, we will not apply small company provisions even if they fulfill this criteria. Okay, so this is it with our very first amendment, the small companies discussion. A uh, small company is a company whose paid up share capital does not exceed 50 lakhs and turnover does not exceed 2 crores. This 50 lakh number the government can increase up to 10 crores. This 2 crores number the government can increase up to 100 crores. So exercising this power, the paid up share capital number the government has increased to 4 crores and the turnover number the government has increased to 40 crores. So summary, a small company is a company company whose paid up share capital is within 4 crores and turnover is within 40 crores. But these four companies, even if they fulfill these criteria, will not be considered as small companies. Number one, public companies. Number two, holding and subsidiaries. Number three, section 8 companies. Number four, statutory corporations. Clear? So this was it about our first amendment relating to small companies. Now coming uh, one step forward, going one step forward, MOA AOA chapter. Here, if you see, a new concept altogether has been added about the physical verification of registered office. By the way, before I forget, let me tell you, 
uh, all those of you who already have the fourth edition of my uh, law book for CA Inter, all these amendments are already incorporated in the book. Okay, you just have to go through one extra amendment. I will let you guys know. Apart from that, all the other amendments are right there in your book itself. So you don't have to worry. Others who do not have the fourth edition of my book, you can uh, uh, download a PDF of this uh, amendments file from my telegram channel, the link to which I will put in the description box below. All right, so coming back to my discussion. Now in the MOA and AOA chapter relating to MOA and AOA, two amendments, two concepts we have to learn. One is a newly inserted concept about physical verification of registered office. See here, the ROC can do a physical verification of registered office. We are giving a power to the ROC. If the ROC has a reason to believe that the company is not carrying on any business or operations, then ROC can personally, physically he can come and he can verify the registered office of the company. For example, it's been many years, company has not filed financial statements with ROC. Or it's been several years, company has not filed annual return with ROC. ROC is wondering, company, are you even there? Are you even existing? Company, are you carrying on business? Are you carrying on operations? ROC is wondering. So in such cases, ROC to, you know, get his doubts clarified about the company's business, whether the company is existing or not, to get those doubts clarified, the ROC can personally, physically, on his own, he can come and he can verify the registered office of the company. Understanding. Now, when he comes for this uh, verification, he can bring along with him two witnesses also. But these witnesses should be independent. The company's employee itself cannot be a witness. They have to be two independent witnesses belonging to the same locality in which the RO is situated. If the RO thinks it is, if the ROC thinks it is required, he can also take the help of the local police. Okay, and after doing the verification, ROC will anyways have to prepare a detailed report about the verification. In this verification report, he will have to also attach a photograph of the registered office. So he can take a photograph of the registered office of the company after verification. All right, so till here, let us uh, understand once again, what are we learning about a new concept altogether called physical verification of registered office. Now here, this power has been given to whom? ROC. If ROC gets a doubt about the existence of the company, if the ROC gets a doubt that whether the company is actually carrying on business operations or not, then ROC can personally come and verify the registered office of the company. He can bring along with him two witnesses these witnesses have to be independent witnesses that is they should not be connected to the company and all and, and these witnesses should also belong to the same locality where the registered office is situated if required he can also take the help of local police okay then we learned he has to prepare one detailed report after the verification is over and in in this report he will also have to attach a photograph of the registered office so after the verification is over he can click a photograph of the registered office uh, all right for the purpose of preparation of report now listen we will deviate a little and we will come back if you remember we had learned about the entire process of incorporation of the company. In the process of incorporation, we had come across section 10A. Section 10A tells us that uh, from the date of incorporation of the company, within 30 days, the company is supposed to file with the ROC verification of the RO address. Basically, address proof of the registered office we have to file with the ROC within 30 days from incorporation section 10A. So, we have already filed the address proof. Instead of calling it address proof, we call it verification of registered office. Okay, so we have already filed the verification of registered office with the ROC. Now, that address proof, that verification of RO, the ROC can bring along with him and he can cross verify these documents with the actual registered office of the company, with the actual registered office address of the company. He can cross verify the documents filed by the company with respect to the registered office address. The ROC can bring along with him the address proof which the company would have filed for verification of registered office address and the ROC can compare the address proof and the actual registered office address and see whether they are in line or not. All right, let us say ROC had come to the uh, registered office for verification and it so happens that the registered office happens to be in the middle of the jungle, one small hut in the middle of the jungle. 
tell me is it possible to you know uh, deliver letters to such an address right in the middle of the jungle one small hut no so in case the roc finds that the address is not capable of receiving mail then roc will give a notice to the company and directors and will ask for representation within 30 days if roc does not get any satisfactory explanation from them then roc will simply remove the company's name from the register understood guys simple so the physical verification of registered office a new concept altogether introduced by the come introduced in the companies act we are giving a power to the roc that roc if you have a doubt about the existence of the company if you have a doubt that whether the company is actually carrying on business operations and all or not if roc is, is having these kind of doubts then roc can personally physically he can go and verify the registered office and when he goes to verify the registered office he can take along with him two witnesses they have to be independent witnesses belong to the same locality roc can also take the help of local police roc can take a picture of the registered office and after verification is over he has to prepare a detailed report then under section 10a within 30 days from the date of incorporation of the company company would have filed address proof of the registered office with the roc that is company would have filed verification of registered office with the roc roc can cross verify these documents with the actual registered office address of the company if the roc is of the opinion that the company's registered office is in such an address is in such a place which is not capable of receiving mail for example it is in the middle of the jungle it is not capable of receiving post and all then roc can send a notice to two people guys to company and directors and the roc will ask them for representations for justifications within 30 days if they give satisfactory justification within 30 days fine but if they are unable to give a satisfactory explanation then the roc will simply remove the company's name from the register of companies you understood the last part also yes if the roc thinks that the address of the company is not capable of receiving mail then roc will ask the company and directors to give representations within 30 days if roc thinks those representations are not satisfactory roc will pass an order asking the company uh, roc will simply remove the company's name from the register so you always remember guys a company exists only till its name is there in the register which is maintained by roc from that register once a name is removed no company also ceases to exist so if the company's registered office is in a place which is incapable of receiving mail then what will happen if it is in a place which is incapable of receiving mail then roc will first of all send a letter to the comp a, a notice to the company and directors asking them to send representations within 30 days if we don't get satisfactory representation roc will remove the company's name from the register taking you to the next amendment now in section 16 see before we come to the amendment let us try to understand the existing provision first let me discuss it with you over here see what does section 16 say let us say we are incorporating a company you must be aware the company's name should not be identical it should also not be similar to the name of another existing company or it should not be identical or similar to the name of another existing registered trademark okay like for example if i want to start a company now can i start a company with the name reliance private limited no because my company's name will be similar to the name of reliance industries limited which is an existing company and if i start another company with a similar name public will get misled public will start thinking that my company is having connections with reliance industries limited we don't want that so the company's name should not be identical or similar to the name of another existing company it should also not be identical or similar to the name of another existing registered trademark let us try to understand this now what is this registered trademark like for example paytm this is a trademark which is owned by the company 197 communications limited now 197 communications limited is the name of the company and paytm is a trademark which is owned by them so now can i start a company with the name paytm private limited no 
the company's name should neither be identical similar to the name of another existing company nor should it be identical or similar to the name of another existing registered trademark please don't just write the word trademark write the word registered also the company's name should not be identical or similar to the name of another existing company it should also not be identical or similar to the name of another existing registered trademark okay see if it is similar ideally the roc shouldn't even reserve that name in the name reservation process in the incorporation process right this if i'm going to start a company with the name reliance private limited technically speaking roc shouldn't even reserve that name in the incorporation process but let us say name reservation was done company was incorporated this company has come into existence but its name is identical or similar to the name of another existing company or another existing registered trademark now in such cases central government has a power central government can pass an order asking the company to change the name within 3 months generally to change the name special resolution is required but when central government is asking the company to change the name company will have to change the name by passing ordinary resolution itself special resolution not required understood so if the company's name is identical or similar to the name of another existing company or to the name of another existing registered trademark then central government can pass an order asking the company to change the name within 3 months by passing a simple ordinary resolution once the company has changed the name then company has to inform the roc about it once the company has changed the name company will send to the roc first of all a notice informing the roc see we have changed our name this is our new name and company will also give to the roc a copy of central government's order a copy of the order because of which company had to change the name okay then roc will make a note of this in their register roc will give to the company a new certificate of incorporation containing the new name this is a process all right so company has been incorporated company's name is identical or similar to the name of another existing company or similar to the name of another existing registered trademark the central government is asking the company company come on change the name in such case company should change the name within 3 months simply by passing an ordinary resolution after changing the name company should inform the roc company should send to the roc a notice informing the roc about the change and company should also send to the roc a copy of the order a copy of the central government's order asking the company to change the name roc will make a note of this and roc will give to the company a new certificate of incorporation containing the new name of the company this is a process okay and you know in the we are still talking about the existing provision only we haven't come till the amendment all right listen in the existing provision only there is one more concept in case the name is similar to the name of another existing registered trademark then here alone there is a special provision here the person who is the owner of the trademark this person has to file an application with the central government this person has to request the central government by filing an application through this application only the owner of the trademark will be requesting the central government to please ask the company to change the name this application has to be filed within 3 months from within 3 years from the date of incorporation of this company see i am incorporating a company with the name paytm private limited wrong isn't it because the company's name paytm private limited is similar to the name of another existing registered trademark paytm so technically i shouldn't incorporate but i was able to incorporate roc also did not stop me let us say so from the date on which this company got incorporated within 3 years from that date the person who owns that trademark that person has to file an application with the central government this 3 years point is applicable only when the company's name is similar to the name of another existing registered trademark the person who owns the trademark has to file an application with the central government requesting the central government please ask that other company to change the name that application has to be filed within 3 years from the date of incorporation of that other company 
Understanding, guys. So this is the existing provision. The so I'll just quickly summarize it for you. Central government has the power. Central government can ask the company to change its name within three months by passing an ordinary resolution. If the company's name is identical or similar to the name of another existing company, or if it is identical or similar to the name of another existing registered trademark, time limit is always three months. Earlier for trademark and all, we used to have six months time limit. Now, whether the company's name is similar to the name of another existing company, whether it is similar to another existing registered trademark, time limit is three months. Within three months, company is supposed to pass a simple ordinary resolution and change the name of the company. Okay, once a company has changed the name, company has to send a notice to the ROC informing the ROC about the name change and also giving a copy of central government's order to the ROC. ROC will make a note of this and ROC will give to the company a new certificate of incorporation containing the new name of the company. In fact, you know, there is a time limit for this also. When should the company send all this to the ROC? Once the company changes the name from the date of the change within 15 days, company has to inform ROC, company has to send a notice to ROC and also company has to uh, uh, give a copy of central government's order to the ROC. So for both of this, these points, the time limit is generally 15 days. Okay, so this is the existing provision. But listen, what if the company, lazy company, is not changing the name? Central government has asked the company to change the name. But what if the company is not changing the name? Three months over, it did not change the name by passing ordinary resolution. Now what will happen? This is where the amendment is. The, the non-compliance part is newly introduced. In case the company does not comply with central government's order. Earlier, we used to ask the company and the officer in default to pay a penalty story over. But now the penalty has been removed and instead a whole different process has been prescribed. In case the company does not does not follow central government's order, does not change the name within three months, then what will happen? In that case, central government itself will allocate a new name to the company. All right. And this new name, they will not think of some nice name and all and allocate. You know what this new name will be? It will be ORDNC. ORDNC as in order of regional director not complied. See, here we are saying that central government will pass an order asking the company to change the name, right? Central government in reality has uh, delegated this power to regional director. So in practical scenarios, who is going to ask the company to change the name? The regional director. So the regional director's order was not complied with. So if the company doesn't change the name, even though regional director has asked the company to change the name, if company is not changing within three months, the RD, the regional director itself will change the name of the company. The new name will be ORDNC, order of regional director not complied with. Then whichever year the order is passed, let us say the order is passed in 2023, then the serial number of the order, let us say 15, and the corporate identification number of the company, private limited if it is a private company or just the word limited if it is a public company. This will become the new name of the company. Understanding guys, so in case the company is not following, not complying with the order of the central government, not complying with the order of the regional director, then the central government, regional director, they will change the name of the company. They will themselves allocate a new name of the new name for the company, which will be order of regional director not complied with here, serial number and the corporate identification number. This new name will be put into the register of the companies. The ROC, he has to put this name into the register of companies and this ROC will give to the company a new certificate of incorporation containing this fancy name. But listen, now companies starting to feel embarrassed by this name because everywhere, wherever company's name is written, company will have to put this name. Company is starting to get embarrassed. Now company is asking, can I change name now? That time when central government asked me, I did not change name. Can I change the name now? Okay, company, if you want to change, change now. But now if you change, you will have to follow the regular provisions. Now if you change, you will have to follow the usual provisions. What are the usual provisions to change the name? You will have to pass a special resolution, get central government approval and all. All that will apply. This part is an amendment, the newly inserted part. 
did we understand guys yes so this was section 16 through section 16 i am giving a power to the central government if the central government comes to know that a company's name is identical or similar to the name of another existing company or to the name of another existing registered trademark central government can pass an order asking the company company come on change your name within three months by passing an ordinary resolution once a company changes its name within 15 days company has to send to the roc number one a notice of the change and number two a copy of the central government's order ROC will make a note of this. ROC will send to the company a new certificate of incorporation containing the new name of the company. If the name of the company is similar to the name of another existing registered trademark, the owner of the trademark has to file an application with the uh, central government within three years from the date of incorporation of such a company. Then we learn to what if the company is not complying with the order. Central government is asking the company to change the name. But company is not changing the name. Then what will happen? No penalty and all anymore. Instead, the RD will simply allocate a new name for the company. Then that new name ROC will make a note in his register of companies. Then the ROC will send to the company a new certificate of incorporation containing that fancy name. And everywhere, wherever the old name is written, the company will have to write new name. Now, if the company wants to change its name, the usual provisions will apply. That is special resolution plus central government approval. Understood, guys. So, two amendments in the MOA AUA discussion. The first amendment is about physical verification of registered office, which ROC can do. The second is in case central government is asking the company to change the name, but if company is not changing the name, then what are the consequences? A new name the central government will allocate to the company. That new name ROC will write in the register of companies. That new name ROC will issue a new certificate of incorporation containing the new name, and everywhere the old name has to be removed and the new name has to be put instead now if you want to change the name of the company you have to follow the usual provisions of the act that is special resolution and central government approval okay guys so with this we are done learning our first two sets of amendments first of all we learned about a small company and then we learned about the two points under moa and aoa after this we have one small tiny amendment relating to prospectus let us see this this is a simple amendment, the next amendment. They've just made one small change to section 42, which talks about private placement. You know, private placement, right? Where the company is picking and choosing a selected group of people and the company gives the offer to buy securities only to that selected group of people, right? So company and a selected group of people, the company is sending the offer in the form of private placement offer come application. So company sends POCA to the selected group of people, not to the general public. Only the selected group of people, only they can subscribe to the company's securities. This is private placement. Public company, private company, any company can do private placement. Here we are not offering securities to the general public. Here we are identifying certain people and only to those people we are offering securities by sending them private placement offer come application. All right. So in section 42, a new provision has been inserted saying that this offer shall not be made to a body corporate incorporated in a country which shares a land border with India or with a national of a country which shares land border with India unless its body corporate or national has obtained government approval under FEMA rules and attached the approval with POCA. So, if the company wants to send POCA to a body corporate or to a person, this body corporate is incorporated in a country which shares land border with India. For example, Pakistan shares land border with India, China shares a land border with India, Bangladesh shares a land border with India. So, if you are sending POCA to any body corporate which is incorporated in our neighboring countries like these, or if our company is sending POCA to any national of any of our neighboring countries, then company can send only if the such body corporate or such national has obtained government approval under the FEMA rules and the government approval should also be attached to this POCA. 
simple right so whom are we targeting we are targeting nationals and body corporates belonging to those other countries which share land border share land border means what our neighboring countries our neighboring countries which share land borders like pakistan afghanistan china nepal bhutan bangladesh uh, these are the countries which share land border with india so if our company wants to send private placement offer come application to a body corporate which is incorporated in these countries or to a person who is a national of these countries then such national or such body corporate should have obtained government approval under fema rules only then we can send poka to such people simple small one only then we have another adjust another amendment in the deposits chapter uh, deposit return if the company is accepting deposits whether the company is accepting deposits from the public whether it is accepting from the members if it is accepting deposit it has to file deposit return in form dpt3 every year guys every year by 30th june it has to file like for example for financial year 2223 by 30th june 2023 company will file this audited dpt3 audited deposit return it has to be audited in form number dpt3 along with fees company will file with roc in that form the auditor will declare that he has done the audit of the deposit return and everything seems to be fine this is the only change that the auditor will put a declaration in this form dpt3 that he has audited dpt3 and everything seems to be fine we already know about deposit return it's a common point applicable to both whether i accept deposits from the members whether i accept deposits from the uh, from public in both company will have to file dpt3 with the roc dpt3 is always audited and the time limit to file dpt3 is 30th june we know all these things now in this dpt3 the auditor will add a declaration saying that this deposit return is audited and it is you know as per the rules of the companies act simple then taking you to the next set of discussions under the charges chapter the first amendment in the charges chapter a newly inserted concept if the company did not register the creation of charge or satisfaction of charge with the roc then the company has to disclose details about it in the financial statements so the first point is just asking the company that company you did not register creation of charge with roc you did not register satisfaction of charge with roc now you put details about it in your financial statements simple the second point the second amendment it's not an amendment as such but this is just something which i wanted to discuss with you this seems to be a little important from the examination perspective from the charges chapter so i just brought in this extra point to discuss it with you i'll explain it to you over here first okay see listen the company has done something wrong what did the company do see it created a charge or let us say it satisfied a charge or let us say it modified a charge so the company should have registered this with the roc right company did not register it with the roc it neither registered with the roc on time nor did it register it with the roc within the extended time even the extended time even the extra time limit given is over or let us say whether the company is creating the charge satisfying the charge or modifying the charge the company would have filed some documents with the roc to register these with the roc okay so the company would have filed some documents now in those documents there is either an omission omission means what either some important information is not written or there is some misstatement basically some wrong statement is written okay and now company wants to rectify now if the company is going to come to the roc even extra time is over roc will not entertain roc will ask the company to simply get out because we gave you so much extra time even in that extra time you are not coming see when you are creating the charge we give the company 60 days another 60 days when you are you know satisfied when you have to register satisfaction of charge we give you extra 270 days so so much extra time we are already giving you even that extra time is over company did not register the charge did not register the creation of charge and all with the roc even within the extra time now if you are going to come to the roc roc is not going to entertain 
okay so in such cases what the company can do is the company or any other person any other person this will obviously be the charge holder the company or any other person may make an application to the central government requesting the central government please condone the delay they will have to convince the central government the central government no doubt delay has happened but this delay is accidental this delay was not done purposely because of this delay creditor is not getting affected we have to convince the central government once central government is convinced central government will pass an order asking the roc roc it's okay even though company is coming so late it's okay let us forgive the company let us rectify the register or let us you know now do the registration of charge now let us register you are understanding so the company has already done this it created the charge or it satisfied the charge or it modified the charge all the three we have to register with the roc for all the three registration we have some time limit we also have some extra time limit you must have learned all this in the charges chapter even in that extra time limit they did not register the charge with the roc or they registered but in the documents which they filed for registration they are either containing omissions or they are containing misstatements now what will happen either they are containing omissions or they are containing misstatements now the company or any other person this any other person will be charge holder company or any other person being a charge holder any other person can make an application to the central government because if now if the company is going to the roc roc will not accept because roc will say even extra time is over now i am not going to entertain so company or any other interested person like the charge holder can go to the central government can request the central government central government i know we have come late but please excuse the delay please condone the delay we will have to prove to the central government that central government listen the delay was not purposely done it was accidental it was inadvertently done even though we are doing a delay but don't worry creditors are not affected there is justifiable reason if you are able to convince central government central government will pass an order asking the roc that roc it's okay even though the company has come so late let us register all this or even though the company has made a mistake it's okay let us rectify the register now understood guys so this concept only i put even over here in the pdf company has done two defaults either the company did not inform the roc within specified time that is company did not register the creation of charge satisfaction of charge within the specified time or there is a omission misstatement in the documents which we have filed with the roc now company or any other person can make an application to central government convince central government that the delay was accidental it was inadvertent it does not affect the shareholders it does not affect the creditors there was a justifiable reason there was a sufficient cause convince the central government then central government will pass an order asking the roc to rectify the register of charges or to rectify the omission or misstatement or to give little more time in registering the payment or satisfaction of charge give little more time we know time limits are over but it's okay let us give a little more time or they have made mistakes they have either put a mistake they have either, either have a misstatement or they have an omission in the documents it is okay let us write let us rectify the uh, register now all right so uh, this is the concept that i wanted to discuss with you company or any other person will make an application to central government if central government is convinced that the delay was justifiable central government will pass an order asking the roc to now you know rectify the register to rectify the misstatement or the omission to register the satisfaction of charge now even though time limit is over okay guys so our first discussion under charges was that in case we have uh, you know um, created a charge or we have let us say satisfied a charge but we did not register the creation or satisfaction with roc then in that case we'll have to disclose about it to the uh disclose about it in the financial statements then our second concept over here was in case the company uh, has not informed roc on time about satisfaction of charge or even within extended time company has not informed 
or in the documents there is a misstatement there is some omission and all and time limits and all are over then the company will have to request the central government to condone the delay if central government is convinced central government will pass an order asking the roc also to give you little more extra time okay now listen i am taking you forward to the next discussion under the charges chapter non applicability of provisions relating to registration of creation and modification of charge listen in case the company happens to be a bank and the charge holder that is the lender the person to whom the asset is security this person happens to be rbi in other words if the bank is creating any charge in rbi's favor now this charge and all does not have to be registered with roc if you are going to create such a charge or if you are going to modify such a charge and all it doesn't have to be informed to the roc okay understood this point also simple only in case my company is a bank and this bank has created a charge in favor of rbi that is bank is borrowing some loan from rbi and in return bank is giving some asset some collateral as security to rbi if the bank is creating a charge in favor of rbi now that charge does not have to be registered creation of that charge doesn't have to be registered modification of that charge doesn't have to be registered with the roc going forward now the next amendment see in case a company is going through a resolution resolution here indicates insolvency resolution company is going through an insolvency or company is going through liquidation let us say now if we have to file any form with roc for creating a charge for registering the creation of charge or for registering the modification of charge or for registering the satisfaction of, of charge or for condonation of delay if we have to file any form with the roc relating to charge if the company is going through an insolvency or liquidation then the insolvency resolution professional the liquidator the resolution professional these people only will sign these forms okay so in case a company is going through an insolvency or if the company is going through a liquidation process now if the company has to file any form relating to charges with the roc those forms will be signed by whom if the company is going through resolution will be signed by the insolvency resolution professional if the company is going through liquidation the liquidator will sign that form okay so this is it about our discussion regarding the charges chapter first of all we saw that in case a company did not register the creation of charge or satisfaction of charge then that has to be disclosed in the um, financial statements then after that we learned that in case the company has uh, you know uh, not registered the satisfaction of charge the time limit is over even now the company hasn't registered even the extra time limit is over still the company hasn't registered or if in the documents there is any omission there is any misstatement and all then the company or any other person can request the central government to condone the delay if central government is convinced that the delay is accidental inadvertent not purposely done not affecting the creditors and shareholders then the central government will pass an order asking the roc to give little more time to the company or asking the company to rectify the omission to rectify the misstatement then we learned if the company is a bank and the bank has created a charge in favor of rbi now creation and modification of such charge doesn't have to be registered with the roc finally we learned if the company is going through insolvency or liquidation then all the forms relating to the charges all the forms have to be filed have to be signed by the insolvency resolution professional and the liquidator as the case may be all right guys so we've learned about small company we've learned about physical verification we saw the amendment in section 16 we saw the new point under private placement deposit return and now charges chapter now let me take you forward to the meetings chapter we're going to the next set of amendments now in the meetings chapter here we have only one amendment relating to inspection okay let me explain the existing provision to you first we are talking about inspection of two things uh, inspection of the register of members number 1 and number 2 the inspection of annual return okay same concept for both the inspections 
inspection of register of members, inspection of annual return. First of all, who can inspect? See, any person can inspect, member, non-member, anybody can inspect. But if member is inspecting or if the bench or holder is inspecting, or if a person who is having beneficial interest, if he is inspecting, then I will not charge any fee. I hope you understood beneficial interest. Section 89, person who has beneficial interest, he has to disclose about the beneficial interest to the company. Section 89, remember, I would have given you examples in class about me and my driver. I don't want to buy shares in my name, so I will buy shares in the name of my driver. Now, the driver will be the registered owner, but I am the one who has beneficial interest in the shares. So, if the member of the company or debenture holder or if a person who has beneficial interest, me, if any of us are, in, are inspecting, then they will not charge any fees. But if any other person, non-member, any other outsider, is, if they want to inspect, we will let them inspect. Even outsiders can inspect. But from them, we can charge a fee. The fee will be maximum rupees 50 as prescribed in the AOA. Okay. Now, when can they inspect? Can they come knocking the door at, you know, 2 in the night and say, we want to do inspection? No. Come during business hours. Come on a working day and you can inspect. Okay, now can they also take copies? Yes, not only can they inspect, they can also take a copy. If they're asking for a copy within seven days, we have to give them the copy. And in case they are asking for a hard copy, we can also charge from them rupees 10 per page maximum fees we can charge. Okay, so this is the existing provision that in case anybody wants to inspect the register of members, register of members section 88, or if anybody wants to inspect the annual return section 92, yes, we will allow inspection. Any person can inspect, even outsiders can inspect, not necessarily only the members, anybody can inspect. But if our members, debenture holders and persons with beneficial interest, if they are inspecting, we will not charge fees from them. If any other outsider is inspecting, then we will charge maximum 50 rupees fee from them for inspection. Uh, they can inspect only during business hours. They can also take copies. They can also take a photocopy of the register, photocopy of the annual return, we will allow. But if they want photocopies, within seven days, we have to give them the copy. And if they're asking for a hard copy, then we can charge even 10 rupees maximum per page. We can charge for the hard copy. Okay. Now, what is the amendment? See, this register of members will contain a lot of confidential information about the members. And it will not be nice if even all that we are allowing inspection. Register of members will also contain the address of the shareholders. It will also contain the email ID of the shareholders. It will contain the unique identification number like Aadhaar number of the shareholders. It will, it will also have the PAN of the shareholders. Now, all this information, if we are going to all, allow all this also to be inspected, it may not uh, you know, be safe for the shareholder. So, all of this, we will have to hide all of this and only the balance register and annual return, we can allow for inspection. When we are allowing inspection of register and inspection of annual return, these four data, these four information should not be allowed. These four information should not be made available. <clears throat> Are you understanding, guys? When we are allowing inspection of register of members, when we are allowing inspection of annual return, we cannot allow the, you know, details like confidential details, like address of the members, email ID, their unique identification number, like their Aadhaar number, PAN and all, all these we have to hide and only the balance register only we can allow for inspection. So, this is the amendment relating to the management and administration chapter, the meetings chapter. When we are allowing inspection, inspection of these four things we will not allow. Address, email ID, unique identification number and PAN. Okay, simple discussion, meetings chapter. Now, coming to the dividends chapter. See, in dividends chapter, you remember learning about investor education protection fund. We had learned that uh, in a lot of some lot of sums of a lot of sums of money have to be credited to the IEPF by the company. For example, company declared dividend, okay, but the shareholder did not come to collect the dividend. 
we waited for seven years after that unpaid unclaimed dividend we will transfer to iepf similarly unpaid unclaimed debenture redemption amount unpaid unclaimed preference shares redemption amount deposit repayment amount all of these if they are remaining unpaid unclaimed for seven years and all company will transfer all of these to iepf we know this right now relating to iepf there is one more point that we have learned one more point which we uh, have already learned under the accounts of companies no under the meetings chapter under section 90 in the meetings chapter under section 90 under sbo we had learned a concept now that concept is being connected with iepf and accordingly amendment is being made in iepf provision also don't worry i will simplify it for you listen See, Section 90 of Companies Act talks about significant beneficial owner, which you must have learnt in the meetings chapter. Okay, so if I am a significant beneficial owner, I have to file a declaration with the company in form BEN 1. Okay, and the company will file a return of SBOs with the ROC. This will be in form number BEN 2. This is a basic provision. Now, so this particular provision is putting full responsibility on the SBO and SBO you have to file with the company then only company will file with ROC but section 90 also puts a responsibility on the company that company if you think that a person is an SBO but that person is not doing all this or if you know a person who was an SBO but did not submit this declaration and all or if you know a person who might know an SBO and if such people are not following all these SBO rules and regulations and all company can give notice to such people and company can ask information about SBO from such persons I'll repeat again listen to me carefully see let me re-explain SBO significant beneficial owner he has to give a declaration to the company in form number ben 1 through this he will inform the company that i am an SBO being an SBO is not wrong it's just that you have to inform the company okay company will then file a return in form ben 2 with roc okay now this responsibility is on the SBO that you have to file declaration but companies act is also putting a responsibility on the company that company even you do your own research if you think a particular person is an sbo but he has not followed all these rules and all he has not filed declaration and all then you can give notice to him and you can ask information from him so if company has given a notice to such a person and company is asking information from him within 30 days this person should give information to the company if he doesn't give information within 30 days then within the next 15 days company will go and inform the nclt about it company will file an application with the nclt about it as soon as company files an application with the nclt nclt will first give opportunity of being heard to this person within 60 days then nclt will pass an order once nclt passes an order what order by the way nclt can pass an order restricting the rights on those shares basically whatever shares are held by this person his rights on those shares will get restricted so he will not be able to vote on those shares he will not get dividend on those shares and all so on those shares rights of a member will get restricted all right now once nclt passes this order if this person is not okay with the order he can appeal against this order within one year. If he doesn't appeal within one year, it will indicate that he is accepting the order. He is accepting he is wrong. If he doesn't appeal within one year, then his shares will get transferred to IEPF. That is the amendment. The amendment is that his shares will get transferred to IEPF. I will repeat again. This is slightly tricky. This last part, I will go through it again. Don't worry listen we said that if the company thinks a particular person is an sbo but this person has not filed this declaration and all or if the company thinks this person was an sbo or if this person knows an sbo if company you know wants any information from such a person company can send him a notice and ask for information he should give information within 30 days if he doesn't give within 30 days then the company within the next 15 days will inform nclt will file an application with nclt 
NCLT within 60 days will pass an order against this person, obviously after giving opportunity of being heard. Under this order, this person, whatever shares he has in the company, rights on those shares will get restricted. Okay, which means he will not be able to enjoy the rights on those shares. Alright, once this order is passed, within one year, this person can file an appeal. If he is not filing an appeal, then whatever shares he has in this company, these shares will get transferred to IEPF. Look at last part. If company has given notice under section 90 to a person asking for information regarding SBO, and if he doesn't provide the information within 30 days or he's providing information but it is not satisfactory information, then company will apply to the NCLT within 15 days, next 15 days. Within 60 days, NCLT will pass an order restricting the rights on those shares. Okay, and then the aggrieved party, the party against whom the order is passed within one year, he can file an appeal. If he doesn't file the appeal, those shares will get transferred to IEPF. That's it. So this was our amendment relating to dividends. Now coming to the next amendment relating to the accounts of companies. We just have uh, the last set of dividends. The last set of amendments are in the accounts of companies chapter only. Here we have two sets of amendments. One is relating to electronic maintenance of books of accounts and the other amendment is relating to CSR. Okay, first of all, what are the amendments relating to electronic maintenance of books of accounts? See, if the company wants, yes, company can maintain books of accounts in electronic form. Okay, if it is maintaining in electronic form, I hope you remember we had studied separate set of rules and regulations. We had said that those books of accounts should be accessible in India. We shouldn't maintain the books of accounts and books and papers and all in such a fancy software that we have to go to the US to access the software. It should be accessible in India. It should, you know, retain all the information in the original format. Backups we have to keep taking. We have to inform ROC, the cloud address, the, the details about the service provider ip address all that we had discussed right then we are maintaining books of accounts in electronic form now what are the amendments there are totally three additional points okay three additional points have been inserted what are they number one it should be accessible in India at all times. They have added this point that whatever software we are using, even earlier the law was, even the, uh, even earlier the law said that the software should be accessible in India. If I want, I can maintain books of accounts in electronic form, but those books of accounts should be accessible in India. Now, they should be accessible in India when they should be accessible in India at all times. First insertion. Second insertion, earlier we used to say that backup has to be taken periodically. Now that has been amended and the law is now saying that the backup has to be taken daily, every day. Okay, the last point, even earlier we used to say that in case, you know, we are using a service provider, we are using, we are maintaining the books of accounts in electronic form, then we have to inform ROC details about the service provider, his IP address and all that. There we are adding another point. If the service provider is located outside India, then we also have to inform the name and address of the person in control of the books of accounts and other books and papers in India. If the service provider provider is outside India, then we also have to inform ROC that who is the concerned person who is controlling our books of accounts and books and papers, that person's name and address. So these are the three additions into our electronic maintenance of books of accounts concept. If you want, you can maintain your books and papers and your books of accounts and all in electronic form. And if you're maintaining them in electronic form, the software which you're using should be such that it, is, it should be accessible in India at all times. It shouldn't be that if you want to access the software, if you want to access the books of accounts, now you have to travel to another country. It shouldn't be like that. And every day backup should be taken. And whoever is responsible to, you know, maintain our books of accounts, that person's name and address has to be informed to the ROC if you are taking the help of a foreign service provider. Okay. And then coming to the last set of amendments relating to CSR. Okay. Section 135 CSR. Now, um, why do we have so many amendments in CSR? Listen to me. 
Number one, the reason being a lot of FAQs have been inserted by uh, the Ministry of Corporate Affairs recently clarifying a lot of points about CSR. And number two, I have also put over here the CSR related amendments which were applicable for November 2022. I just thought I'll put them again over here because CSR is going to definitely be important for May 2023 and November 2023. All right. So let us go through all the CSR related amendments once and for all. Listen. Let us run through these amendments now. The first amendment, the CSR expenditure can be in three routes. Whatever CSR expenditure we incur, it can be an activity route. That is, Schedule 7 talks about various activities, guys. So any of those activities I can pick and I can, you know, spend CSR on that. So I can spend the CSR money on that activity. Like, for example, one of the CSR activities mentioned in Schedule 7 is education. So I can set up a school, the company can set up a school, the company can spend CSR money on, you know, providing ed free education for poor children and all that will come under CSR. So CSR can be done in activity route. That is, we are choosing an activity from Schedule 7 and we are spending our CSR funds on that activity. Okay. Or it can be through funds route. Now in Schedule 7 itself, various funds are also written. Like for example, we have PM Cares Fund in Schedule 7. We have the Clean Ganga Fund in Schedule 7. We have Swatch Bharat Kosh in Schedule 7. So we can simply go and donate money, contribute money into these funds. Even that will be considered as CSR. Or we can also, you know, spend our CSR funds by making contribution to incubators and R&D projects, contributions to institutes and organizations. In CSR, under Schedule 7, a lot of organizations are involved. Like, for example, we have DRDO, then we have the Department of Biotechnology. Various organizations and incubators are listed in Schedule 7. So, we can also contribute money to those organizations, to those R&D projects, to those incubators. Even that will be considered as CSR. So, when we are spending money on CSR, it can either be done on activity route, that is, I am picking an activity given in Schedule 7 and I am spending the money on that activity. Or I can do the CSR activity uh, in funds route, which means I am donating money to a fund which is written in Schedule 7. Or it can be through an organization, through an incubator, through an institute, uh, through an R&D project which is listed in Schedule 7. I can simply go and give money or contribute money to that organization or to that R&D project. Even that will be considered as CSR. So it is not necessary that the company has to, you know, sit, make an activity, think about an activity, plan an activity and then do it only that will be csr no in addition to doing c in addition to spending the csr money on activities it can also spend money on you know uh, in the form of contributing to specified funds in schedule 7 or contributing to incubators and organizations specified in schedule 7 first point the second point the company can spend csr funds on creating health infrastructure for covid now, for COVID-19, if the company is spending money in, you know, establishing medical oxygen generation plant or if the company is spending money in supplying oxygen uh, concentrators, oxygen cylinders, ventilators and all, then even that will be considered as eligible CSR expenditure. So, company, whatever money it is spending in, you know, providing oxygen cylinders, ventilators, all health infrastructure relating to COVID-19, even that will be considered as eligible CSR expenditure. Then, if the company is sponsoring COVID-19 vaccination of persons other than employees and family members, other people, other outsiders, other than employees and family members, other outsiders, their vaccination, COVID vaccination of the company is sponsoring, even that is considered as eligible CSR expenditure. Then, you must have heard about the Har Ghar Tiranga campaign recently, I mean, this time uh, when we have Independence Day. Right uh, in August 2022, right before the independence day, this Hargar Tiranga had become very popular where they were, you know, insisting that uh, every house, you know, uh, uh, hoists the national flag. So, uh, activities related to Har Ghar Tiranga campaign, such as mass scale production and supply of the national flag, will be considered as CSR activity. Har Ghar Tiranga. This is actually a Hindi, uh, you know, phrase which means that there should be 
a national flag in every house har is every ghar is house and tiranga is the national flag so uh, so this is a campaign which says that there should be a national flag hoisted on every in every house so uh, for this campaign under this campaign people are you know producing national flags in huge scale because during independence day you know in uh, august 2022 independence day at that time the number of flags national flags which were sold in our country in the month of august broke all records because of this campaign so all people who were manufacturing all companies who spent money to manufacture flags under the har ghar tiranga campaign whatever money they spent to manufacture those flags even that will be considered as csr expenditure so whatever amount they have incurred in you know producing and supplying the national flag that will be considered as csr expenditure not only producing even supplying the national flag will be considered as csr expenditure then from schedule 7 they have in they have now removed iits national laboratory indian council for agricultural research indian council for medical research council of scientific and industrial research department of atomic energy and department of science and technology they have removed all these points from schedule 7 so now we cannot make a contribution to these institutes and these organizations okay then uh companies can enter into csr activities and projects in collaboration with other companies this point was there even earlier but just that the fo faq once again stresses upon this point that it is not necessary that the company should be doing the csr activity on its own it can also collaborate with another company and two companies can together do the csr activity but then in that case it should be done in such a way that each company can report separately each company should be able to report how much each of them has spent but if they want they can together do the activity that is allowed okay then this is very very important guys when companies covered by section 135 file their financial statements with the roc annually as an attachment to the same they shall also file csr report with the roc in form number csr2 this is extremely important from the examination perspective see from the date of the agm within 30 days okay the company is supposed to file the financial statements with the roc the audited and adopted financial statements company is supposed to file with the roc within 30 days from the date of the agm now to the financial statements company has to attach csr2 this csr2 is nothing but csr report okay so this is a new point that along with the financial statements we now also have to submit csr2 to the roc and that csr2 is nothing but the csr report of the company okay then csr provisions are applicable to even section 8 companies new clarification then csr provisions you will think about for each company separately just because for the holding company csr is applicable doesn't mean for subsidiary company also csr will be applicable mandatorily each company has to be seen independently just because csr is applicable to holding company or subsidiary company it need not necessarily apply to the company also just because to the holding company it is applicable doesn't mean even subsidiary company has to do each company it will apply separately all right then if a company has unspent csr account it shall have csr committee as long as it has money in unspent csr account till then at least it needs a csr committee see earlier the rule was for 3 years continuously if the company doesn't uh, fulfill conditions for csr for 3 years con uh, continuously then company need not have csr committee okay in c there are some uh, conditions right only if those conditions are fulfilled company has to spend money on csr it needs so much net worth so much turnover so much profit only if the net worth turnover net profit are a certain level only then csr is mandatory earlier the rule was for 3 years continuously if none of those net worth turnover net profit none of those conditions are fulfilled for 3 years continuously then company can stop having csr committee now the rule is see now the rule is in two part see if the amount to be spent on csr 
if that amount is more than 50 lakhs then we need a csr committee okay also till we have money in unspent csr account till then we need a csr committee i hope you are aware of the unspent csr account you know right if you're going to be if, if we did not spend two percent of the average net profits because of an ongoing project then the balance shortfall amount we transfer into unspent csr account money has to be used from there within three years you know about unspent CSR account. So in case the company is having money in unspent CSR account, till the money is there, company needs a CSR committee. Also, if the amount which the company is going to spend on CSR is more than 50 lakh, even then the company needs CSR committee. This is a new provision regarding CSR committee. Okay. And then after this, the last amendment in CSR is about impact assessment, which I will explain to you over here. It is important. All right. Listen to me. See, First of all, what is impact assessment? Now, company is spending money on CSR because the society has to be benefited. But did the society actually get benefited by your CSR activity? Not necessarily. So, the company has to assess the impact of its work on the society. The company has to assess, did the society actually get benefited by my CSR activity or not? Okay, so, but then this impact assessment is not required for every company. It is required only if on an if the average CSR obligation of the company. See what is CSR obligation? The two percent of the last three years average net profit, right? So you will see what is the average CSR obligation of the la of of uh, three preceding financial years. Okay, if this happens to be at least ten crores, only then impact assessment is required. What is CSR spend first of all? What is CSR obligation first of all? Average of last three years net profit, 2% of that. Company has to minimum spend how much on CSR guys? 2% of the average net profit of the last three years, right? Now you find what is a 2% number of three preceding years. Find the average of that. Is that at least 10 crores? So if the company has to minimum spend an average of 10 crores on CSR in three preceding financial years, then impact assessment is required. This impact assessment has to be done through an independent agency. Now, this impact assessment will be done by the independent agency and then they will give the impact assessment report to the board of directors. Okay. Now, for this impact assessment, obviously the company will have to incur money independent agency and all will charge money for impact assessment so the total expenditure which the company is spending on this impact assessment can be five percent of the csr expenditure or 50 lakh rupees whichever is lesser this was the earlier rule the earlier rule was five percent of whatever money company is spending on csr or 50 lakh rupees whichever is lesser now the amendment is instead of 5% we are taking 2% and instead of whichever is lesser we are taking whichever is higher. That is the amendment. So impact assessment, how much money can the company spend on impact assessment? 2% of the CSR expenditure or 50 lakh rupees whichever is higher. See, we still have 5% number somewhere. Do you remember where in CSR only we have the 5% number also somewhere admin overheads how much company can spend at the maximum on administrative overheads maximum company can spend five percent of the csr expenditure there we still have five percent impact assessment expenditure alone has been changed to two percent of the csr expenditure or 50 lakh rupees whichever is higher that's a maximum which the company can spend on impact assessment all right so this is it with the amendments relating to csr now, the plan of action is like this. I will first give you a revision, a quick revision of what we've learned under CSR. And then we will run through all the amendments once again and we will close. Okay. You must have for sure guessed by now that CA, uh, Companies Act amendments for May 2023, not very heavy. Right. Listen, CSR amendments, number one, whatever money I'm spending on CSR, either I can spend it in activity route. Activity route indicates I am, you know, um, activity route indicates that I am spending money 
on a particular activity which is mentioned in schedule 7 like for example a rural development or slum area development or let us say education or sanitation i am spending money on activities mentioned in schedule 7 or i can simply contribute to a fund which is written in schedule 7 or i can uh, simply give money to an incubator or to an institute or an organization which is mentioned in schedule 7 many of these institutes and organizations they have now removed from schedule 7 all right you remember we saw all these institutes and all are now removed from schedule 7 anyways coming back then we learned that the company can also spend its csr money on creating health infrastructure relating to covid 19 okay for establishing medical oxygen generators oxygen cylinders ventilators and all if the company is spending money on all this relating to covid 19 even this will be considered as csr expenditure then we learned if the company is going to spend money on vaccination okay covid 19 vaccination of people other than employees and family members even that will be considered a csr expenditure then if the company is spending money on you know producing and supplying national flags under the har ghar tiranga campaign even this will be considered a csr expenditure then all of these institutes are removed from schedule 7 you cannot make contributions to these institutes under schedule 7 anymore then we learned if the company wants it can collaborate with another company two companies can together do the same csr activity but each company should be able to report separately then an extremely important point we learned from the date of the agm within 30 days company will be filing financial statements with the roc to those financial statements company will have to attach from csr2 which will be a report on csr okay then we learned just because holding company has to spend money on csr doesn't mean even subsidiary company has to follow csr rules okay then we learned till the company is having money in unspent csr account till then it needs csr committee also if the amount to be spent on csr is more than 50 lakhs even there the company needs csr committee and finally we learned on impact assessment maximum how much money can the company spend two percent of the csr expenditure or 50 lakhs whichever is higher but we also said this impact assessment is not applicable to every company how how will we decide to which company is it applicable see if you're finding it difficult follow steps to see what is the minimum obligation that the company has to spend on csr in the last three preceding financial years the last three years how what is the minimum amount which the company is supposed to spend on csr what is the minimum amount that the company is supposed to spend two percent of the average net profits of the last three years so you find the minimum obligation of last three years divide by three you will get the average minimum obligation of last three years is it average obligation is at least 10 crores then only impact assessment is applicable and if impact assessment is applicable maximum how much can you spend on impact assessment two percent of the csr expenditure or 50 lakhs whichever is higher okay guys so this is it with our amendments so let us quickly have one revision and then we shall be good to close first of all we had learned about small company small company the paid up share capital number has been increased to 4 crores and the turnover number has been increased to 40 crores first amendment the second amendment new concept has been inserted about physical verification of registered office if the roc has a doubt that the company is not carrying on business or operations then roc can physically go and verify the office here an important point we had learned that if the roc realizes that the address is incapable of receiving mail roc will send a notice to the company and the directors who will have to give representation within 30 days if they don't give satisfactory answer within 30 days roc will remove that company's name from the register of companies then under section 16 we said if the company's name is identical or similar to the name of another existing company or another existing registered trademark central government can ask the company to change the name within three months by passing ordinary resolution if the company doesn't change the name within three months by passing ordinary resolution then the central government itself will allocate a new name to the company the roc will also make a new make a note of the new name in the register and roc will give a new certificate of incorporation to the company now everywhere this new name has to be used if the company now wants to change its name it can change but now if it wants to change the name it will have to follow the usual provisions of the act that is special resolution and central government approval 
Then we learned if the company wants to give POCA, private placement offer come application to any body corporate or to any person who is an, uh, a body corporate which is incorporated in our neighboring countries or a person who is a national of our neighboring countries, then company can give POCA only if these people have obtained government approval under the uh, FEMA rules. Okay, then we learn BPT3 which is the uh, audited deposit return which we have to file with ROC by 30th June, this audited deposit return will now also contain a declaration from the auditor saying that yes, he has done the audit. Okay, then under charges, we learned that in case we are not registering the creation or satisfaction of charge with ROC, we have to disclose about that in the financial statements. Then we had learned about condonation of delay. Then we learned that in case the com company is a bank and the company is creating a charge in favor of RBI, then no need to register the creation and modification of such charge. Okay, then we learned if the company is going through insolvency or liquidation, then all forms relating to charges will be signed by the insolvency professional and by the liquidator as the case may be. Then after that, we discussed about inspection. When I allow inspection of register of members and annual return, I will hide all this information about the address of the members, their email ID, the unique identification number, their PAN and all, I will hide. Only the balance register and annual return, I will allow inspection. Do not forget, anybody can inspect, even outsiders can inspect. But if outsiders are inspecting, we can charge maximum 50 rupees for inspection. Then we learned if uh, then we learned about SBO and IEP, IEPF connection. We had learned we had learned that in case a person, in case company thinks a person is an SBO, okay, or if company thinks a person knows an SBO, company can give a notice to that person and company can ask for information. That person should give information within thirty days. If it doesn't give, then within the next fifteen days, company can make an application to NCLT. Within 60 days, NCLT will pass an order restricting the rights on those shares. If this person wants now, he can file an appeal within one year. If he doesn't file an appeal within one year, his shares will be moved to IEPF. Okay. Then we learned that yes, you can maintain your books of accounts in electronic form. But if you're maintaining books of accounts in electronic form, then that software should be accessible in India at all times. Backup you have to take every day. Daily backups have to be taken. And finally, we saw the amendments relating to CSR. The most important ones being CSR report has to be filed in form CSR 2 with the ROC along with the financial statements every year. And on impact assessment, maximum we can spend 2% of the CSR expenditure or 50 lakh rupees, whichever it is a year. Got it? Yes, so with this we come to an end to all our amendments applicable to CA inter corporate and other laws for May 2023 exam. Right, guys, I hope you've understood and you will find the PDF in my telegram channel. You can join the telegram channel and you can download it from there. All right, guys. So I think with this we come to an end to our amendment sessions. Thank you.